Always wonderful worshiping here at Battleground Community United Methodist Church. Great being with you. The uh, incident that took place between Nicodemus and Jesus reminds us, at least me, of something that continually happened in the life of our Lord. And that was that all kinds of people during all kinds of time during the night and during the day came to be in conversation with Jesus came to seek advice, came to, in essence, be in a conversation with him. And the assortment of people that had and needed those conversations included everyone from scribes, Pharisees, lawyers, a Roman centurion, prostitutes, a young rich man, tax collectors, and disciples. Why, I wonder, did all of them feel like that they needed to be in conversation with our Lord. What were they seeking? What were they wanting? And what especially was a person like Nicodemus needing to have a conversation and seek the advice of Jesus? Some years ago, I remember reading a story about a father and his son. They were in a grocery store. The uh, young boy was uh, in the car seat, or the seat of the, uh, of the cart, and uh, they were going through the aisles, and the father would take something off one of the aisles, put it in the cart. The young boy would reach down, take that out of the cart, and throw it on the floor. And as he was going by, he would reach and pull things off the aisles, and then suddenly he was able to escape from his seat And now he's running up and down the aisles, and the father is running after him as well. And the father, as he's chasing his little son, says now, it's okay, Tommy, it's okay. Just be patient, Tommy, just be patient. We'll be home soon, Tommy, we'll be home soon. Don't worry now, don't worry. Well, there was a woman who was also shopping there and noticed this exchange between the father and the young son. And after a while, she walked up to the dad and said, boy, Uh, I must say you have a remarkable way with your son Tommy. The man looks at the woman then finally says, ma'am, you don't understand, I'm Tommy. (laughs) I think one of the things that happened between Nicodemus and maybe this dad is that they both came to the conclusion that sometimes either really quickly in life or something that kind of just gradually happens to us, we realize we are not control of life. Ever had that moment where you realize that in fact, we're not in control of life the way we thought we were? And I think Nicodemus and Jesus have that understanding. I think also there are maybe moments and times in our life, I don't know about you, but, There are times when I think some occasions kind of help us ask the question, is this all there is to life? Sometimes there be moments where maybe life seems a little mediocre, a little mundane, a bit stale and a bit pale, and we kind of wonder, yeah, is this really and truly all there is to life? Now, one of the reasons that I think Nicodemus sought out Jesus can be found in an earlier chapter in the Gospel of John, the second chapter, but it is an occasion in Jesus' life that's found in all the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but it happens much later on. And that's the occasion, you remember, where in the second chapter of John, Jesus throws out the money changers in the temple. You recall that incident? Okay. So there, in that situation, we find Jesus basically saying that he is angered and frustrated about what's happening in the temple. As far as he is concerned, the temple is being abused and misused. And then Jesus has this kind of powerful, provocative statement that he says, tear this temple down, and in three days I'll rebuild it. Remember that? Okay. Tear this place down to the ground, and in three days I will rebuild it. Well, obviously, what John is trying to say is that, in essence, the temple is now found in Jesus. Jesus is the new dwelling place of God. It is not a building. It's not the temple. It is actually this man from Nazareth. 
So obviously, word must have gotten out on the streets and eventually into the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin is the Jewish Supreme Court, 70 members, and Nicholas, Nicodemus, excuse me, was one of those 70 members. And so folks were asking and talking about what on earth did this mean? And eventually the Sanhedrin, those 70 Supreme Court members, must have asked themselves the question as well, what are we going to do with Jesus? What are we going to do with him? So we read that Nicodemus finds Jesus at night. And a number of commentators have said that when you read the word at night, it basically means that Nicodemus is still in the dark about Jesus being the light of the world. Okay? So what that means is that in essence, we find out that Nicodemus thinks that Jesus is a wonderful teacher, but he gives no indication that he thinks Jesus is the Messiah or the Son of God. There may be two other reasons why Nicodemus tries to locate and find Jesus at night. One of those is maybe just a sense of caution on the part of Nicodemus. He probably didn't want anyone, particularly the 70 members of the Sanhedrin, knowing that he was seeking to find Jesus, this kind of wannabe prophet, this guy that's making a lot of trouble and making a lot of noise. If they knew that Nicodemus was going to see Jesus, they would wonder, why on earth are you doing that? So maybe by night, Nicodemus thought, I can have a conversation with Jesus and maybe no one will know. The other reason, though, that Nicodemus might have gone to see Jesus at night is because of the Jewish tradition that in biblical times, rabbis and teachers, they read the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, at night when things were calmer and quieter, and maybe they then could discern the reading of the Torah. So obviously they didn't have iPhones and iPads and personal computers and big screen televisions and Xboxes. Thanks be to God. <laughs> but they did have, in essence, a time in which Nicodemus felt like, now I can go and I need to go and have this conversation. So the conversation begins by Nicodemus basically saying, wow, Jesus, I don't know if you're the son of God, but you certainly are a follower of God because you're doing all these wonderful signs. And Jesus basically says, well, tell you the truth, Nicodemus, all these wonderful signs that I'm doing is not really important. What I'm trying to convey to you is the importance of having a substantial change in your life who you understand your life to be and what you are doing with your life. If you're going to be connected in any way with me, you have to realize that a person is going to change and they're going to change substantially. And so then he asked Nicodemus, have you been born anew? Have you been born above? Or in the King James Version, it says, have you been reborn? Now, I don't know about you, these are all good questions, but I must admit over the years I've been a little confused and unsettled and startled at these questions that Jesus is raising to Nicodemus as I think Nicodemus was startled at the questions as well. So for just a moment, let's kind of ponder and probe these passages um, as Nicodemus did as well. And I think one of the things that kind of unsettles me about are you born again is that for a long, long time, there have been a circle of Christians who kind of felt like that this was the critical kind of question about whether you were truly Christian or not. If you could tell someone the date, the time, and the place in which your rebirth happened, then you were legitimately a Christian. I've struggled with that understanding, although I've known a number of Christians who, in fact, have been able to say, I was reborn on this day, on this date, this time, and in this place. All of that is legitimate. But for this morning, I want us to kind of ponder and probe a little bit deeper about what it might mean for us to be reborn. And one of the things I think we need to remind ourselves of is that it is only Nicodemus in all of the Gospels that Jesus asked this question, okay? You can only find it with the exchange between Nicodemus and Jesus in the Gospel of John. Normally, if you look at all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, probably one of the better definitions that we get 
is the one where Jesus simply but profoundly says, follow me. We read that time and time again in all the Gospels, Jesus in essence saying, if you want to follow my way, <clears throat> then you need to follow me. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so time and time again in all of the Gospels, if Jesus said anything to most people, he basically said, follow me. So for instance, with the disciples, Jesus said, yes, follow me, but if you're going to follow me, pick up your cross and follow me. That was with the disciples. On another occasion, a person came and said, Jesus, I want to bury my father. Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead, then come and follow me. The rich young ruler said, Jesus, I want to follow you. But Jesus said to the rich young ruler, sell all that you have, give to the poor, then come follow me. Another occasion, Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you really need to become like a little child and to learn what life is really about. On another occasion, Jesus said that, in fact, you need to leave your family, your father and your mother, and then come and follow me. So the point that I want to try to share is that there are a lot of things in Scripture in which we can turn to to try to help us understand what it really means to follow Jesus. It's only in the Gospel of John, only the relationship between Jesus and Nicodemus, that this question, this phrase is being asked, have you been reborn? Okay? So there is a mixture of messages that Jesus is trying to share with us about what it means to follow him. In fact, in the book of Acts, you may remember that the Christians were called the people of the way. And what was the way? It was the way of Christ. And if you declared to be a Christian, you were in essence basically saying, I'm trying to follow in my life the life of Christ as best I understand it. So the issue of rebirth is important. The consequences, the responses, the experiences are all important and what that rebirth does to us. But I think we need to realize when it says you must be reborn scripturally, that's the only conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. Other conversations, Jesus had different comments, different challenges to different people. Does that make sense? Okay, because sometimes I want us to take a look at the whole biblical picture as best we can, rather than citing into kind of one scripture passage and say, ah, that's it, that's everything. Well, for Nicodemus, it was. But for a lot of other folks, it wasn't for Jesus. He said different things to different people. He asked different things of different people. Now, remember Nicodemus's response to all of this? It's, in some respects, a little bit hilarious, if you will. Not outright funny, but just kind of a Jewish chuckle, if you would. Here we have Jesus basically saying, wow, Nicodemus, you're a leader of Israel, and this is the best you can do. This is the best you can come up with. Nicodemus' reply reminds me a little bit of kind of a teenage response, if you will. I was once a teenager not that long ago. And um, I raised two teenagers, I've hung around a number of teenagers, and my experience with them is that oftentimes they kind of see things in black and white, right? It's either yes or it's either no. So Jesus has Nicodemus getting in this conversation with him, and Nicodemus is saying, now, how actually does this work, Jesus? I, I'm not quite sure, are you saying that we're old but we can be young again, or... Um, uh, wow, I mean, are you saying I can enter into a mother's womb a second time? What's really going on here? And Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, will you get with it, okay? Will you understand what I'm trying to say to you? The message is in the meaning. The message is in the metaphor that I'm sharing with you. I'm not asking you to take this literally, what I'm saying, in terms of re being reborn, but I am asking you to take it seriously, okay? And I think sometimes that's how we have to read scripture as well. If you read the parables of Jesus, you can't read them literally because they're stories, okay? So you don't bring your intelligence necessarily to try to figure, figure things out. You bring your imagination to the story and try to dig and probe and to see what's that kernel of truth in that story, that parable that Jesus shared, and what does that story have to do with the story of my life? So basically, Jesus is saying the meaning is in the metaphor, the meaning is in the message, 
take this seriously, but don't take it literally. I'm not asking you to kind of enter your mother's room a second time. I'm asking you to understand that once you get involved and invested in the life of God, you cannot remain where you are, okay? That's the message Jesus wants to say. Nicodemus, you cannot be the same, okay? God accepts you for who you are, but God will not allow you to remain who you are. And that message is for all of us as well. However, we might want to say that we have a new birth. The outcome of that new birth is this. God will not allow you to remain in the same place in life. The change might be so fundamental in your life that you fact think that you have been reborn, that a new life has come your way. Don't know how many of you remember a fellow by the name of John Gardner some years ago. He wrote a great book on titled The Search of Excellence. And it was an award-winning book. John Gardner also was a president and CEO of a number of large corporations in the United States. He was the professor at Stanford University for a number of years, also head of the Health, Education, and Wellness Department uh, in Washington, DC. A reporter asked him on occasion, Dr. Gardner, why have you had so many jobs? And Dr. Gardner said this, you know, I believe in repotting. I'm an amateur gardener, and I've noticed when you put a plant in a pot and it just stays there, that oftentimes the plant will either get stunted or it might die. So I've looked at my life and sometimes I've seen bigger visions, broader vistas, and I've realized I need to repot myself. I need to move on. There's something that I should be doing that I'm not. Kind of reminds me a little bit of Bob Dylan's comment, said, if you're not busy being born, then maybe you're busy dying, okay? If you're not busy being born, then maybe, just maybe, you're busy being dying. The thing I like about Jesus in all of the comments and conversations he has with all kinds of folks, he basically says this to them and to us. I'm not going to allow you to live a half-life, okay? If you're going to be in a relationship with me, a half-life is not going to work. I'm going to call you to a whole life. And we read that also in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10, where Jesus says, I've come to give you life and life in all of its fullness. So Jesus says, when I get involved in the life of people, they may kind of feel like, wow, this is such a new life for me. It feels like a second birth. But I do agree with our Lord when he says, I've come to give you life and life in all of its fullness. And I think that in many respects what it means to be a Christian as well. That we, as John Wesley said, were born to be reborn. That our first birth, our physical birth, leads to our second birth, our spiritual birth. Okay? And as one person said, fear not that your life may come to an end. Fear that your life may never have a beginning. And that's what new birth is all about. New beginnings. Living a way that we thought was never possible, but was only possible because God entered into the world in the life of Christ, and Christ has entered into our world and our life. And now, as the Apostle Paul says, we are a new creation. Nicodemus hears, you must be reborn. Apostle Paul says, I'm going to talk about it this way. You are a new creation, okay? Our soul is to be converted, says Paul, but the soul of our society is also to be converted as well. We have both things with our life we need to be about and the larger world we need to be about as well. So for John Wesley, he told folks, I want to convert your soul, but I want you to help me to convert the soul of the world that we live in, to make it clear to everyone that the kingdom of God can come on earth as we pray for it each and every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. So, are you born again? We might have different experiences and responses to that question. But maybe the larger question for all of us is, how is God helping you move from a half a life to a whole life and spending the rest of your life in the pursuit of what rebirth and new birth means for all of us? Amen.